So um, what do we know about the importance of antibodies and B cells in hepatitis B? For many years, it's been assumed that antibodies are predominantly playing a role in the prevention of infection and maybe limiting HPV spread. Um, but there's emerging evidence that uh, not just in hepatitis B, but then in other chronic viral infections, um, antibodies play a critical role in, in the control of ongoing infection. And this is partic particularly nicely emphasized by studies in HIV, um, where therapeutic broadly neutralizing antibodies are um, able to mediate uh, immune control of H HIV and to kickstart adaptive immune control by T cells. Um, in HPV, we've got clear evidence of the role of B cells in ongoing control from the use of the B cell depleting drug, rituximab, where both in resolved patients um, and in those with low-level HPV who've been given, given rituximab in the past, uh, we quite often see profound flares of disease activity with increases in HPV viral load and or ALT flares. Um, so remember, rituximab will not be depleting the existing antibodies or any long-lived plasma cells. So it's acting on B cells. Um, and so um, this really underscores a central role for B cells in ongoing HPV control. What do we know about um, the role of different antibodies in HPV? Um, I mean, we use these, of course, as the standard um, uh, biomarkers for defining different clinical phases in HPV, but we actually know very little about what they're contributing to the pathogenesis and control of the disease. Anti-HPV core we use as a uh, diagnostic marker for just exposure to HPV infection, and it's widely assumed that the anti-core antibodies are actually not doing anything um, because they're present in all, all different patients, but I think uh, detailed studies looking at their actual fine specificity, uh, the sort of FC region functionality of those antibodies um, hasn't been done. And uh, there are some studies suggesting they can play a pathogenic role, certainly in acute fulminant hepatitis B. Um, we do see increases of HPV core um, antibodies of the IgM uh, isotype in pathogenic flares. Um, so are they perhaps playing some a role that's been missed? Um, similarly, with anti-HBE antibodies, we use those as a marker of moving from different phases of the disease, but whether they're able to exert any immune pressure has not really been studied properly. Um, and then with anti-HBS antibodies, um, of course, those can either be directed to the pre-S1 or the A determinant. Uh, we know very clearly that they are protective following vaccination or passive immune transfer. They are the hallmark of resolution of acute infection. They're not usually detectable in chronic infection, although sometimes low levels can be detected. Um, and I'll come on to the fact that we may be missing a lot of anti-S antibodies because of um, immune complex formation. Um, they develop in spontaneous or treatment-induced resolution, and they are, of course, the goal by which we measure functional cure. But what we don't really know is, um, as I said, are they actually, these anti-S antibodies, are they being produced in most patients with chronic hepatitis B, but they're just not detectable because we've got this huge sink of circulating S antigen that might be absorbing a lot of the antibodies. Um, when we do see anti-S antibodies emerging in resolution, is this just a byproduct of the fact that we now have HPV control and so we've lost S antigen and so we can now detect the antibodies? Or have those anti-S antibodies actually contributed to the viral clearance in some way? Um, do we have some factors limiting the production of S, ant S antibody because the B cells are being completely deleted? Or are they there and just dysfunctional? And is there then some potential to recover, recover any existing B cells for long-term immune surveillance? And then we need to also think about the non-neutralizing functions of, of antibodies and the other potential antiviral role of B cells, because B cells are just not um, factories to produce antibodies. They can do many other important things in, in chronic viral infections. Um, I hope this is visible. So just to go through um, the different potential roles for antibodies and B cells. Um, so as I've mentioned, um, a lot of the antibodies that will be potentially produced against anti-HBS will be absorbed by circulating S antigen, which is thought to be a, a viral decoy factor, which could be um, 
uh, soaking up the antibody and also, remember, will be binding to the um, B cell receptor um, in the cases where this is directed against anti-HBS and could be driving B cell exhaustion. Um, but, of course, some of these antibodies would be then capable of neutralizing um, any virions and should then prevent um, viral entry. Um, but as I've mentioned, antibodies have many other functions, and it's become clear again from the studies in HIV that their capacity to harness both innate and adaptive immune cells through the FC region binding means that they actually can do so much more than just neutralize virus. Um, so um, they, oops, sorry, um, they're capable of um, binding uh, and to the FC region on NK cells and uh, triggering antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Um, and it's not totally clear how much s antigen is actually expressed on the surface of infected hepatocytes. Um, but it, undoubtedly, there'll be some surface antigen budding from hepatocytes and will be in the vicinity of them. Um, and that could allow um, immune cells such as NK cells to then uh, lyse these infected cells and remove, um, completely remove infected hepatocytes. Um, there's nice studies from various um, murine antibody studies in HPV showing that um, Kupfer cells uh, or other monocytes that can mediate ADCP um, are very important for removing uh, virions, again, through FC binding. Um, and then there's some very elegant work in, in the studies of, again, HIV and cancer studies showing that uh, immune complexes can bind to a subset of dendritic cells and can uh, promote cross-presentation. So they can therefore then trigger T cell responses. So to try and address whether um, essential specific B cells actually persist in chronic infection, and if they do, if they do what's wrong with them? Um, Alice Burton in my group uh, carried out her PhD looking at this in collaboration um, with Nadej Paletia from Roche using um, a FITSI labeled bait to be able to bind specifically to S antigen B cells. Um, so this bait binds to um, the B cell receptor, um, and um, you can see that then when we sort the cells that are bound here, uh, we can confirm that they are S antigen uh, specific with an Ellis spot and uh, a lysers, and the instead negative fraction has none of these cells in it. Um, so what we found, uh, to our surprise, when we started looking in patients with chronic hepatitis B was that, in fact, a majority of these patients, over 60%, did have persistent s antigen specific B cells. So even though we can't detect antibody in these patients, the cells that should produce those antibodies are still circulating. Um, but there was no sort of clear correlation between the frequency of these cells and any clinical parameters that we looked at. So then we, we questioned whether they instead had some qualitative um, differences. And what you can see here is now just phenotyping these B cells. Because we were able to stain them directly ex vivo using this bait, for the first time we could start to ask what were their phenotypic properties. Um, and just dividing them up into now a sort of classical memory B cell subsets, um, in the patients who had been vaccinated and where we could detect these B cells, most of them had this classical memory phenotype. And by contrast, um, looking in the patients with chronic hepatitis B, um, you can see that there's this expansion of this red population, which is this what's called an atypical memory B cell or an aged B cell, which has down-regulated um, both CD21, a component of the B cell receptor, um, and CD27. And these atypical memory B cells have been described in other settings of chronic viral um, antigen stimulation. They're probably a sort of equivalent of the exhausted T cell to some extent, um, because they not only downregulate this key uh, signaling component, but they upregulate a lot of inhibitory markers, including some of the ones that are well described on T cells like PD-1 and LAG-3. Um, and here's the data for PD-1 um, on these atypical B cells, where it's highly enriched on the um, atypical fraction compared to the global B cells, but also enriched on the bait staining cells in chronic hepatitis B compared to vaccinees. 
Um, but importantly, those same um, PD-1 high B cells have high level of a transcription factor, which Robert just talked about, TBET. And in B cells, we know that TBET is absolutely critical for their antiviral function in vivo, at least in mouse models. So this suggests that these um, S-antrospecific B cells are programmed transcriptionally to be highly potent antiviral B cells, but are being constrained perhaps by molecules like PD-1. So to now try and look and see what these different um, B cell functions are like in chronic hepatitis B, this is just, again, reminding you that B cells um, can, of course, differentiate into antibody secreting cells or plasma cells and produce antibodies, but they can do many other things, antigen presentation um, and production of antiviral cytokines. Um, so when we stimulate those B cells to produce antiviral cytokines, we see that in chronic hepatitis B, um, the uh, atypical fraction has a very impaired production of, of antiviral cytokines like IL-6 and TNF compared to the classical B cells. And then when we differentiate them in vitro to try and produce um, plasma cells, again, this, this functionality is impaired in the atypical fraction compared to the classical B cells. Um, then sorting on the bait staining B cells, what we could see is that when we then, again, differentiate those cells into, in vitro into plasma, plasma cells and look at their capacity to produce anti-S antibody by ELISA um, in the supernatant, when you look at this in, in vaccinated healthy controls, you can produce plenty of anti-S antibody from this population. But this same population um, sorted from patients with B cells is unable to produce a detectable anti-S antibody. Now, a nice comparison, um, of course, is to look at the core antigen-specific B cells that we know um, in vivo are highly functional because they're producing good levels of anti-core antibody in, in all patients. And so um, uh, Nina Labert in Antonio Bertoletti's group has uh, recently published this comparison using a similar bait staining protocol using reagents from Gilead. Um, first of all, of note, um, you can see that the core um, bait staining responses are a much higher frequency than those against S antigen. Uh, but then going on to look at their atypical uh, uh, phenotype, you can see that the, um, the core staining ones have a, a very low frequency of atypical memory B cells, similar to what you see in vaccinated healthy controls for the surface response, and much lower than the frequency I showed you in the, in the S antigen specific in chronic hepatitis B. And this then correlates with the antibody producing ability because the core antibody producing bait cells are able to produce good levels of antibody just like we see in the vaccinated S response. Can we do anything to rescue these um, exhausted B cells then? So um, uh, both our study and Antonio suggested that a combination of uh, CD40 ligand, IL-21 stimulation and anti-PD-1 blockade may have the capacity to rescue some uh, failed endogenous B cell responses. Um, so you, you can see here we showed that um, cytokine producing capacity was in, enhanced in the presence of PD-1 blockade and the cells became less prone to die through apoptosis. Um, and Antonio's work showed that they, they become able to start to produce detectable antibody again. So just to summarize um, what these, these two studies that came out last year showed is that persistent hepatotropic viral infections like hepatitis B can drive an accumulation of these atypical um, antigen-specific and global B cells, both in the blood. I haven't shown you the data, but we showed this is also the case in the liver. Um, and they have impaired antiviral capacity. They have altered signaling, homing, survival, impaired differentiation into plasma cells, reduced production of antiviral cytokines and impaired anti-S antibody production. Um, and by uh, looking, starting to look at their phenotype, we've started to identify some potential molecular targets that may be used to, to boost more effective humoral immunity for the functional cure of HPV. So um, just very briefly, I want to say that there's um, a number of different strategies obviously being explored to try and boost endogenous immunity. A lot of them are based around therapeutic vaccination um, with checkpoint modulation, immunomodulatory cytokines, reduction of viral load. And we've really been thinking about all of these in terms of their ability to boost T cells, but we need to also be focusing on their capacity to boost B cells. Um, and similarly, we could, it's the last slide, we could replace um, endogenous adaptive immunity 
um, with uh, therapeutic antibodies, and this is actually being uh, studied in a number of different trials now. So for the future, we need to think about um, will reduction of S antigen by some of the new drugs um, allow sequestration of existing anti-S antibodies and recovery of B cell functionality? Um, maybe other drugs that can induce um, CD4 T cell help for B cells will also be able to help with recovery of antibody function. Um, more directly, will we be able to use therapeutic vaccination and specific checkpoints to uh, recover endogenous B cell responses? And will therapeutic uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies be able to induce sustained HPV control? I thank you. <laughs>